It was nothing, son of the jackal, son of a pig. You're afraid of your own shadow. I tell you, I heard a sound, the voice of Wenamon insisted. There's no one here but us and the dead. Make haste with those boxes now. Slowly, uncertainly, Ranifer rose to his knees, then stood. No one here? But what was that face he had seen? Trembling, he peered again through the opening and met the same pair of eyes. This time, though, he shrank back Un, I'm sorry, involuntarily, he realized that they did not move, did not live. They were the inlaid glass eyes of a life-sized wooden statue. And he saw now that they had been partially smashed, as if from the blow of a dagger hilt. Gebu and Wenamon had wanted no gaze upon them as they went about their evil work especially the gaze of this watchful Ushabti, placed here as servant and guardian of the dead. Nervously, Ranifer examined the figure more closely, and his fear of its vengeance changed to an unexpected pity. It was the statue of a slim and lovely servant girl, wearing a painted white dress and a painted gilt or golden necklace, steadying a box on one shoulder and carrying a painted wooden duck by its feet in her other hand. Her expression was one of serenity and joy, and the sculptor who carved the sculptor who carved her, this should be H E R, had been a master. Now her clear, wide eyes were cloudy and blinded by the blow that had splintered them. Her beauty was marred, and her usefulness as a watchful guardian ended. It was like seeing some innocent, happy creature lying murdered, victim of Gebu's callous greed. Callous greed. Ranifer's gaze turned from her to move in wonder about the rest of the chamber, which was dimly illumined by the glow of the torch from the next room. As he looked, a strange emotion took possession of him. Beyond and around the graceful statue were articles of household furniture arranged as in a beautiful home. There were armchairs, and beds of carved wood decorated with gold. There were alabaster honey jars, painted boxes resting on delicately wrought ivory legs. There was a wicker trunk ventilated by little slatted openings through which the fragrance of the perfumed garments within escaped into the room. There were wine cups arranged on shelves there were scent jars and jeweled collars and armbands everywhere was the gleam of gold it was not the gold however that held ranifer's gaze and drew him slowly through the jagged entrance to stand silent and awed within the precious habitation it was the garlands of flowers only a little withered as if placed here in love and grief only yesterday, and the sight of a worn oaken staff leaning against the wall, of two pairs of sandals, a new and an old, of favorite joints of meat placed neatly in boxes as if for a journey. Whatever he had expected, it was not this intimate look of home of a well-loved room to which its owner might at any moment return. Whatever horrors haunted the passage, the passage to the afterlife, they were not here in this quiet sanctuary. Who was the owner? Ranifer's eyes searched farther and halted in surprise. There were two owners. Slowly, soundlessly, he crossed the chamber 
to the pair of silver inlaid coffins on the lids of which were sculptured in gold the figures of their occupants, a man and a woman. They lay as if sleeping side by side, their folded hands eloquent of the same defenseless trust that had caused them to order a sweet-faced servant girl as their only guardian. As Ranifer looked into their quiet golden faces, the stealthy sounds of plundering in the next room became horrible to him. For the first time, he fully understood this crime. He straightened, all his fear gone, and in its place, hot fury. So there's a change in Ranifer here. Please note that in the margin. There's a change in Ranifer here. He's realized what's really going on and how terrible it is. And what's his reaction? Will he be the same Ranifer as before? Those merciless and wicked ones to break into the sacred place and steal the treasures meant to comfort those, to comfort this old couple through their 3,000 years, the afterlife. You should note that in the margin, 3,000 years, that was the afterlife. Whether rich gold or worn out sandals, these things belong to them. No living human had a right to set foot in this chamber. Not even the son of Thutra, who meant no harm. Almost, almost, he could hear the helpless fluttering of these old ones, frightened Baz. So the old ones is in cap, capital, is capitalized here because it's representing the two people whose mummies are there. So strong was the sensation that he dropped to his knees in profound apology for his own intrusion. So a note here, even though Gebu, his half-brother, and Wenemon are doing something far worse, he still feels bad for what he's doing, the fact that he's there and he's invaded their space. Back to the text. As he did so, he saw something else, a stack of wine jars just beyond one of the coffins. They were capped with linen and sealed with clay, and pressed into the clay was a mark as well known to Ranifer as it was to everyone else in Egypt. Uh-oh, I'm predicting here that this is a very important tomb, that these are the mummies of very important people. Write that in the margin. It was the personal seal of the great noble Hua, only two years dead the beloved father of Queen T. Shocked to his very toes, Ranifer scrambled up and retreated a few respectful steps, involuntarily stretching out his hands toward the coffins in the gesture of homage, honoring them. Here lay Hua and his cherished wife Tua, the parents of the Queen of Egypt. And here he stood, an insignificant nobody, daring to gaze into their faces. He was acutely, desperately embarrassed. He felt like a dusty urchin trespassing in a palace, which he was. Worse, at any moment, those thieves would be in here to wreck and pillage, to tear the gold trim from chairs and chests, to snatch the jewel boxes, to break open the beautiful coffins, and even strip the wrappings from the royal mummies themselves in search of golden amulets. You could put as an example here in the margin, like an ankh, A-N-K-H. It must not happen. These old ones should have someone grand and fierce to protect them. They have only me, Ranifer thought. I must do something, anything, go fetch help. He turned and started swiftly toward the entrance hole, too swiftly. 
for his elbow grazed, just barely hit, a little inlaid table and tilted the alabaster vase upon it. So a vase is like a place where we put flowers, a large, large glass, and it's where flowers might go. Tipped it over. He clutched at it wildly in the dark, but it fell, shattering on the stone floor with a crash that echoed like the very sound of doom. Who's doom? In the margin, you might put who's doom? Ranifer's doom? This could spell the end for him, perhaps, because now they know somebody's there. The small noises in the chamber beyond, Gebu and Wenamon hacking away at things, ceased instantly. Ranifer breathed a prayer to Osiris and flung himself behind the coffins which was all he had time to do before the torch and Gebu's murderous face appeared in the doorway. Last! came Wenaman's hiss. I told you we were not alone! We will be soon! Gebu answered in tones that turned Rana for cold. So in the margin over here, what does that mean? What's Gebu going to do? He could see their two shadows on the wall, black and clear-cut. Gebu's bulky one, his bulky shadow, Wenamon's thin and vulture-shaped shadow behind it. The shadows moved, rippled in deadly silence along the wall, leaped crazily to the shadows leaped crazily to the rough ceiling and down again as the two began methodically to search the room. The dancing black shapes advanced relentlessly toward the coffins. The coffins are where Ranifer is. Looming huge as giants as they came nearer, Ranifer's hand groped out blindly and closed on a small heavy object. So he was reaching for something, anything to protect himself on a small heavy object that felt like a jewel box. At that instant, Gebu's rage distorted face was thrust over the coffin. Ranifer lunged to his feet and hurled the box with all his strength. There was a glittering shower of gems as the box struck Gebu full in the eyes. Jarring the torch from his hand, he gave a hoarse cry and staggered backward into Wenamon, who began to scream and curse as he fought the flame that was licking upwards into his cloak. In that one instant of confusion, so Gebu is blinded by this jewel box that has just hit him, and Wenamon is, Wenamon's clothes are on fire, perhaps, or close to being on fire. Ranifer saw his chance. He seized the nearest wine jar and aimed it straight at the blaze, at the flames. So put in the margin what you think he's trying to do by throwing the wine at the fire, the little bit of fire from the torch. There was a splattering crash and the torch hissed out, plunging the chamber into darkness. Just remember, this is the only light of any kind. They are underground. With the reek of wine and scorched cloth rising strong about him, Ranifer leaped for the far wall, feeling frantically along it for the entrance hole. Behind him, the dark was hideous with yells and curses with the sounds of splintering wood and jewelry crushed underfoot as the two thieves plunged this way and that over the wine slippery floor in search of him. Where in the name of all gods was the hole? His fingers met a jagged bit of plaster and beside it empty space. In an instant he was through the hole and stumbling along the black passage 
bent double under its crowding, 